Everybody, it's a DIY show, episode 22. We are talking about holiday lighting this time, and Anthony and I have a really great introduction today. We've got a new member of the the whole DIY team here, Bennett. Hey, Bennett, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ben Harris. I've uh, been on the show a few times as a guest, and I'm pleased to now be a co-host. I'm a maker from Burlington, North Carolina. I produce the Burlington Mini Maker Fair with the help of some folks called the Alamance Makers Guild. Alamance County is our county. And uh, I've got my hands in all thing makery, from electronics to 3D printing to CNC to all the latest news and community building. So I'm very happy to be a part of the show. We're glad to have you, Bennett. Absolutely. Um, I, Bennett's been on the show before. Everybody is, uh, who's been watching the show is. You've actually been here a couple of times. and. It, Everybody, uh, all the feedback I've had is everybody loved, li loves listening to you, so we're glad to have your voice now as a permanent part of the show. Well, good. Thank you. One of the great parts that I'm really excited about this show is that the, the holiday lighting, it's actually a new um, addiction of mine that I've been pulled into by friends, and a lot of people will go really extravagant. Everybody has seen the over-the-top... Um, Christmas displays in front of homes, but it's not just used for Christmas. It's used for other holidays, and we have with us some special, very special guests that use it in not for Christmas, but for Halloween in some awesome haunted houses, as well as a uh, longtime guest, uh, John from Iron Angel Forge. He also uses it on stage for fire effects. So let's start with uh, the manor, Dark Rose Manor. Could you introduce yourself? Well, hey there, guys. Uh, Hi. We're August and Pandora Rose of Dark Rose Manor, located in Aurora, Colorado, just about 20 minutes southeast of Denver. Uh, we've been running Dark Rose Manor now for about how long? Years. <laughs> I think this will be year eight. Year eight, <laughs> yes. Uh, what started as a very simple just Halloween decorations display has significantly evolved over the years, uh, to, say the least. to say the very least, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and what are you laughing about there, Anthony? <laughs> well, you know, I'm actually a fan of you guys' work, um, I'm also in Colorado for those who are just listening, and uh, I was actually able to come visit Dark Rose Manor last year for the first time, I was aware of them through Garage of Evil and some other uh, online websites that you know focus to those of us who who are interested in what I call the Holy Trinity. Trinity that's haunts, horrors, and Halloween. And uh, so I was already familiar with them, but last year was the first time we actually got out, and I was flabbergasted. Um, as some of you who've been listening for a while know, uh, my wife and I used to run a home hunt in Thornton, Colorado, the other end of the Denver metro area, and. We did a hell of a job. I mean, we'd have 2,500 people come through every year, and we'd spend a month setting up, five, six weeks setting up, and uh, breakdown would take about a month. And what we put on was a hell of a show that couldn't possibly compare to Dark Rose Manor. Um, you guys describe your haunt as an We're art haunt. Off and our heads, better stop. <laughs> well, that's what I, that's what I, I mean. I've, I've told you guys I'm a huge fan, and I give credit where it's due and you know you guys describe your haunt as an art haunt and it really is um, everything from set dressing to lighting to the actual showmanship is literally a professional quality in your home and it's a real service to the community well thank we you we really well, appreciate that yeah. and can we say we're excited because although we probably don't use the amount of relays and controllers that the Christmas displays do we, we, and we really like to take the stage dressing very personally so it's great that there's a guest here that uses the lighting on stage so we're going to be learners as much as anything else tonight yeah. so thanks thank for you. having yes. us on guys thank you really. so much 
Yes. Super cool. And then with John, uh, with Iron Angel Forge, there's a, uh, a production group that he's with called Phoenix Rising. Um, just not only lighting, but we're also looking at uh, pyrotechnics and other things like that. And honestly, a lot of this that's used, and this is the biggest part that I always thought that was entertaining, is that uh, I always thought that the Christmas lighting shows were, wow, that's over the top, until I started seeing the haunted houses where they're doing projector mapping and all this other effects that are like, wow, this is, it's far more subtle in the haunted house setting, but it is, the, the amount of technology and the amount of work that has to go into it is just huge. Um, yeah. So I, I'm just really impressed with all that. John, uh, are you still, you, you deal with more of the uh, hazardous parts of uh, showmanship, don't you? That was on fire when I got here. <laughs> 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 um, what we do is actually taking the concept of a haunt to the stage because we're doing, you know, large, with, with Phoenix Rising, we're doing large dance production numbers, and we looked at what stage has evolved into, like Rammstein and Cirque du Soleil, and went, how can we mash those two together and come up with something totally new? And uh, we also have a band called Incantations that we do this kind of a creepy, eerie haunt vibe with uh, guitars and drums and dancer and, and a lot of fire. So, yeah, we, we, we're way off in the other end of the field, but it's a lot of the same technology, just used in a different way. And it's all DIY. So is that kind of like uh, when, you know, you, you mentioned you're bringing the haunt to the stage. Are you doing stuff that's a little more horrific, as in, like, gore kind of stuff? Or is there blood? Is there guts to go along with the pyrotechnics? No. Um, what we're doing is actually the illusion of danger. Um, we're trying to make it look like we're in a lot more danger than we really are, and we want the people in the audience to actually kind of feel the flame. Um, mm. You know, there's a there's a whole safety thing that I'll get into here in a little bit um, that we we adhere to very very stringently. Uh, NFPA 160 flame effects before an audience, and if anybody wants to DIY uh, fire effects in their haunts and stuff, I really cannot recommend enough that you read that whole thing because it applies to you, and that's what the the local ordinances are all written off from. Oh hey, we got a we got a new a new guest. Absolutely, yeah. Danny. You finally, you finally be able to get into uh, the the episode here. Uh, we had a couple of technical difficulties, which the DIY show wouldn't be the DIY show without technical difficulties. <laughs> um, introduction, there, Danny. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, hey, I'm Danny Oakley. Uh, love to tinker and do it yourself quite a bit. Um, a little bit into Halloween. Um, helped the local uh, arts council with. Um, a haunted train that they've uh, put on for the last number of years. Um, so I love to play with that kind of thing. Arduino, electronics. Oh, you're going to fit right in, friend. All right. The uh, let's. I guess let's get started on a good topic. The uh, how did he? A lot, a lot of people that look at what's out there, and if you really start paying attention to what's available, the first things that pop out are the commercial offerings, and the, the expense gets way out of control quickly. Um, real D stage DMX lighting, DMX lighting controls. Um, suddenly, it looks like you have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. And obviously, nobody here spends that kind of money on, on their... Their effects and their their lighting, so Absolutely not. Certainly not. <laughs> so it, let's start with you guys. Um, how did you guys guys get started? What do uh, you guys do it with a basically a shoestring budget, or do you? Uh, how did you get started into it? Well, when we started, um, a lot of people know our story that uh, it was really her just buying some uh, cheesy decorations one year on a clearance rack just to surprise me. And then we thought, well, with our artistic background, surely we could do this kind of thing a lot cooler than, than just cheesy stuff. Cheesier. <laughs> Pack it out there, Tony. Pack it out. So we just thought about it a little bit and said, well, what do we have? And it's like 
what can you do with what you have? It was finding new uses for everyday objects. How do you build a fence? Well, I have irrigation tubing and some old lumber laying around. And like a lot of haunters do, you learn that pallets and styrofoam and milk cartons and just things laying around in the garage can be used for a multiplicity of different effects and illusions. So we just started making props. So we go, if I want a gargoyle, what do I got? I got chicken coop wire. I got paper mache. I want a mausoleum. I've got a little bit of pallets and some lumber and some styrofoam. And so it just grows and grows and grows. You learn new tricks. The YouTube community is rife with tutorials, and uh, it's a very open sharing community for the most part. And you just learn things as you go. Yeah, you start thinking about everyday objects, stuff that you would normally throw away in in a in a new way. Literally, um, I I can't drive down the road on trash day in our neighborhood without slowing down and making sure that I'm garbage picking everything that could potentially be used for haunt. <laughs> Um, and it, and it, it goes that way for just about everything we build, yes. She's string budget for sure. And, it, you know, eventually, yes, it evolves and, and you start saving throughout the year and you wind up spending far more money than you'd like to on it because you have a vision and you need to <laughs> realize the vision. And so, of course, yeah, sometimes you, you blow the budget a little bit. But <laughs> there's a there's a few key ingredients though, yeah, yes. and imagination is certainly the first one. Mm -hmm. um, background: I'm an electrician. She's a web designer, and we're traditional artists, so you just throw that into the mix. And then the last ingredient is the most important one, and that's just a passion. passion. You got to have a passion for it, or mm -hmm. you're not gonna succeed. Absolutely. Amen. 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 And the interesting part is, is what I learned from John here, is that it's not just uh, haunted houses and, and home uh, or personal projects. Uh, they, uh, John, you basically can explain a little bit more. You're doing a full actual production and using the almost exact same techniques, found items. In fact, actually, that's the, one of the keys of your current uh, um, theme of shows. Exactly. Uh, we actually did two major shows this year. One was a classic film noir, you know, the whole detective story and all that kind of stuff. And the other one was post-apocalyptic. And other than some changes in costuming, all of the, the background gear is the same. It's just being used in different ways, um, different lighting, different angles, that kind of stuff. So in, in, one, in one build, you have the smoke machine creating the smoky jazz club. In the other, it's a, a wrecked machine in the background on fire. You know, mm. it's, it's just all creativity. So I have a question. So how much use do you guys make out of microcontrollers that are now readily available and inexpensive, like Arduino and Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, even older PCs that could be used to control things? In our case, almost nothing at this point. Uh, we are going that direction, but everything we have has to be really, really roadworthy. So, for example, our show control laptop is an old Panasonic tough look because if it drops off the table, eh, doesn't bother it. Um, so for somebody who, like, like, you know, the guys at, uh, at the Manor, that may be a lot more effective system. Right. I, I'm getting the distinct impression, John, that we're going to have to discuss a lot of things after the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely think being home haunters, um, our lighting has definitely evolved only insofar as we use more LEDs. We try to move to low voltage, um, but again... My, yeah, microcontrollers. Move, moving yeah, into yeah. controllers and relays, contactors, and back to a computer board for basically what amounts to one month out of our year. Moving into a commercial space, having a control room, being able to run multiple low voltage systems back to a computer. That would be something we envision more in our commercial enterprises in the future. Yeah. I am unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately. Going, uh, bringing John into the uh, control. I've, I've been trying to help them with, uh, well, there's wonderful things all over eBay. And one of them is a 16 relay block that interfaces to an Arduino real quickly. 
Um, along with that, the one of the things that I have found out there is this interesting little program, Vixen Lights. That can interface to that with a using an old computer to do sequencing. Um, yeah. These relays give me a lot more capability. Um, oh, hold on, I didn't put that live. Vixen Lights. If you go to vixenlights.com, um, that's the free software. Unfortunately, it's Windows only, so. We will hear Anthony go boo. Uh, yeah, I would use it. <laughs> <laughs> but this this board was nineteen dollars. Um, it will it has sixteen circuits that handles ten amps each at one hundred and twenty volts. That's sixteen full either lights or um, servos that are activated. Something to activate each function. Fog um, machines. Exactly. You name it. Uh, which gives you quite a bit of power for a very little amount of money, although don't go playing around with the back of it once you get it wired up. Um, <laughs> the other part of it is this little guy, which is an Arduino. Um, this one here is an Uno. In fact, actually, we'll probably get emails from people saying that that is not a real Uno, and you are correct. This is a $6 Chinese copy. Um, the, I, I, for my testing, I buy the cheapies, because if I blow them up, I don't care. Uh, but these two devices really open up the world. I can now control 16 lighting circuits with just on and off for less than $20. And the programming of it, I don't even have to write the program. Someone else on the Internet wrote the program to do that. So I yeah. just load it and then use it with the other device, and I'm ready to go. Um, well, and if, if programming is a problem, if that's something that intimidates people, there's a great language from MIT called Sketch. It's yeah. graphical. You drag and drop blocks on the screen to create programming code. Oh, it's meant for education. Drag and drop around here. Drag and drop is good. <laughs> Danny, I wonder if you could jump in and tell us a little bit about your endeavors and maybe how they fit in with some of this nerdy talk we've got going. Sure. Uh, my background's a little bit of the opposite. Um, PC technician, uh, so microcontrollers was more of the first thing I jumped into, um, and I'm now trying to back out into... Um, um, looking at pneumatic and how I can combine those those types of those types of things. Um, so one of the things I have up front is an Arduino, you know, like I have listed, uh, and I have it hooked up to uh, um, one of the RGB LED strips. Um, so I heard you earlier talking about pyrotechnics. Um, this one I had coded to um, kind of give ambient campfire lighting. Um, you know, for you know, where we couldn't have a campfire, so we huh. did, uh, kind of set that up in the background. That's an awesome idea. Yeah, that's a terrific idea. It's like urban camping enabled. That's right. so much better than our cheap way of doing it. We used to stack up a whole bunch of twinkle lights underneath of uh, some logs to make fake fire. That's a lot better. I've done I've done some of that too. Yeah. Um, so I'll usually I'll usually use them, you know, you know, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I usually use an Arduino Uno um, to do the development, and then, um, like I said, go over to a cheap Chinese. This is, uh, I think, a four to five dollar on Amazon, and it's a lot smaller, so you can embed it into a project. Yeah, those are one of my favorites as well. I've got a set of uh, psychedelic goggles that I made with uh, one of those. The Pro Mini or the Nano, yeah. And then uh, John promptly, well, no, John didn't br uh, break it. His uh, lead dancer broke it right, promptly. <laughs> and she's watching breakage. right now, so that's good. Yeah, and breakage is good. It gives you a chance to rebuild and improve, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It, it's, and it's surprising when, when you prototype something that you don't realize how delicate it is until someone else touches it. Um, but... That's just the lighting side. There's also other things that we, uh, the all of the processors you can actually, a good example of what he's doing with that RGB strip. That, he's, now you're using pulse width modulation for uh, changing the frequency on that, or are you just it, uh, turning it on and off? It, it's not. It's uh, it's an I2C protocol, um, and it has a little chip between each three segment. Oh, those are addressable. So yeah, so it's it's changing the address on it um, multiple times a second. 
Okay, so what Danny's using is it, every one of those LEDs has their own little processor in it, so he's just sending the commands for them to go to the different lighting. Uh, I, 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 now, those are probably RGB, so you're doing, you could even make the fire blue if you wanted to. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Well, one um, other good thing about this technology is you can make it interactive, so you can add sensors for input so you can get feedback. So if you have the crowd approaching or if you have something that's timed where you have a sort of a tour or a ride going through, you can trigger things based on when people are there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Tony, now you've done some, a little, uh, some of this. Uh, did you add any automation? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I had a number of different ways of doing things. I had simple timer circuits, like um, using 555 timers and uh, relays and stuff. To, For example, um, I had a um, coffin that would open itself up by on its own, and as it opened, uh, LEDs inside would give it a red glow, and as the lid of the coffin rate was, was while I came up, it would raise a skeleton that was inside it up, and then it would time out, the coffin would close, and it would f set off a fog machine that was located in it, fill the whole thing with fog again, and then just reset itself. And it would reset itself about once a minute, and this thing would just, it was just using relays to, to time itself, and so as that lid opened, once again, the fog would just sort of pour out the sides, the skeleton would rise in the red lights, and then it would reset. Or I did things like using Arduinos to um, either using pressure sensors or motion sensors could set off some super wicked and super dangerous props that I had in my home on. Um, <laughs> stuff I probably never should have done. But, for example, I learned that you could steal the motor from a uh, paper shredder which is like one of the scariest things I've ever worked with, like scarier than a chainsaw by far. Um, but I, you could hack that motor and just use it simple, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but like armatures off of a motor like that, you could get some really wicked, really terrible movements out of props. And then I would just have it, like for example, as guests would walk past the prop, um, it would just go eight. I almost cussed there. It would go. It would just go ape. Uh, we'll put it that way, and uh, you know, make people poop their pants. So, <laughs> love it, love it. So, speaking of dangerous and, and not pooping your pants, um, <laughs> I've before built Jacob's ladders. So, have you ever seen a Jacob's ladder? You have two spark yeah. gaps. It's like yeah. in the old Frankenstein movie. So, you can use furnace transformers from oil burning furnaces. Um, if you do that, the key is to keep it. We always enclose them in a clear tube so kids couldn't get their hands on it or get. It's more that you'll get burned than you'll get shocked. Um, yes, please. But one key though is to keep those things well ventilated. Put a fan on the transformer because they're not. They're, they're designed to have a sustained arc, but if you're going to run them for a long time, they will get pretty hot because their their duty cycle is more like ten minutes at a time. Huh. My first shop project in electronics was a Jacob's Ladder, and I can tell you from personal experience that, yes, you do get burned from them, and your fingernails glow incandescent when the arc hits you. It's neat. Ooh, so you, can do the, you can do electric pickles that way, too. Digital Equipment Corporation has a famous research paper on bioluminescence. They, it was two engineers, and they were stuck there working in between Christmas and New Year's, and so they decided to use the rest of the, their research budget to determine why pickles will glow when you put high voltage through them. <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing. Have you heard of organic LEDs? They actually mm -hmm. evolved from that report. Oh, right on. Wow. The electric pickle actually makes a great thing in a jar for a haunt, too. And you can fake them with LEDs pretty nicely. The electric pickle makes a great band name. <laughs> Already exists. <laughs> the, the interesting, the interesting part about this, is that it's it seems that a lot of these effects that everybody's using uh, for haunts and everything else, has actually spread into um, people's costuming now. Um, I've actually seen people walking around with for, that are pretty much walking light shows. Uh, it, it's now Burning Man is pretty much that's very common. Uh, going fully portable. Um, in fact, actually, John and I were talking about for one of their uh, 
upcoming shows of lining up, uh, basically making the one of the dancers wigs that are all addressable LEDs that are with uh, basically either Bluetooth or uh, some other wireless protocol synced to the music while they're going. So it's and it's all using these exact same devices that we're, uh, you can get inexpensively. So um, anybody have any uh, tips for each other on uh, uh, ways of cutting corners uh, to save a little bit of money, but not make, you know, and a really good effect. Any good haunter will tell you that don't you ever throw away an old phone charger, an old laptop power supply, <laughs> CA cables. Don't ever throw away an old fan that mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be working. Um, reindeer motors, wiper motors, all of those things that you can find in junkyards, you can find on. Uh, Junker cars, uh, things you thought had no more use, you'll you'd be amazed how much use they actually have. Because yeah, a 24 absolutely. volt or a 12 volt power supply is always going to be just that. Those cables, okay. they make adapters, mm -hmm. and we're not the masters of all of the pneumatics and motor controllers. We have an understanding of them. We just choose to go character actors and more of a stage set design, but our friends on YouTube certainly could attest to what we're saying. Don't ever throw yeah, anything yeah. away. They all have use. Absolutely. Your thrift stores, your local thrift stores, um, stuff that's sitting on that back wall and the electronics section, that's a big deal. Uh, plug it in, make sure it works, and, and go away. I mean, there are bags of cables just sitting there for 25 cents a piece. Get them. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, one thing I'd add, um, kind of from a lighting perspective, because I'm I'm by no means a lighting expert, but I was able to glean a lot of information as I was when you know when the wife and I still had our haunt before we moved up to the hills. Uh, we pretty much stole all our good ideas from places like Garage of Evil, and um, you know there, as was said earlier, there's one hell of a community, and it's a very giving, sharing community. Everyone's really willing to help one another out. Um, but with lighting and stuff, definitely keeping in keeping in mind that you want to use different angles um, and using different colors. So you know, I would do things like um, I would combine blue lights and, say, for example, red or an orange. And if you do blue from one angle and then the orange from another, you get highlights and low lights on your props or your actors or your set. That makes a really big atmospheric difference. Or even things like, um, you know, one of the most popular things you'll find in haunts, of course, is the strobe light. And having a strobe light has an effect. But if you can combine two strobe lights at two different speeds, it becomes incredibly disorienting. Um, and it makes yes. an enormous difference. Like, I've seen people kind of clutching at their gut because as they were trying to make their way down a hallway or something, a darkened hallway with two different speed strobe lights, I'm also making them sick. And I just love that, you know. It's adding another dimension. It's not just sight now. It may not just be sound. But now you're even adding something visceral in their guts. It doesn't get much better than that. Absolutely not. It's Especially perfect. if you're walking on maybe an incline perhaps there. Uh, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, let's make them, make them all seasick. <laughs> ah, the, the puke ray. Um, Sound is a whole other thing, but we'll get to that. I've got one for you guys for haunting that you'll love to death. This is actually uh, something that we kept as a trade secret for a while in the live shows. We had people come up to us and ask us how we photoshopped real life with this. Um, if you've ever gone to Walmart and seen the green tiki torches, we use Green Fire Live. Mm -hmm. And Green Fire looks really creepy. Um, Get the Tiki Torches now while they're on sale. Go to the auto parts section or to the paint area and get either denatured alcohol, which is what we use, or methyl alcohol. Then go over to the grocery section and get Roach Killer, 100% boric acid. Pour a whole bunch of boric acid into the, the uh, methyl alcohol, mix it up good, fill the Tiki Torches. If you dip the wick in 
regular tiki torch oil first, just the tip of the wick. You can you can have an actor walk up to it and light it. It will start yellow, and as it wicks that fluid up, the flame will change to green as you're standing there telling them to you know be warned. This you know that that whole spiel. As they're yes. standing there, it changes right in front of them, and nobody knows how you did it. A lot of people think you're using copper salts or copper wire in the wicks and that kind of stuff. This is much easier. It will leave a film on your wicks. You will have to clean your wicks periodically. Um, but it's it's Photoshop in real life. We alternate that with our regular... Uh, we use a naphtha fuel on our, our regular torches and stuff. And to have alternating green and yellow fire on, say, a hula hoop right in front of them on stage... Everybody is just slack jawed when it happens, because how did we Photoshop real life? Well, we're better than you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but uh, it's, it's a it's a really common science thing. And there's a bunch of other things you can use also for other colors, but most of them have a toxic off gas, where this one does not. Um, this is a relatively safe off gas. Yes, it is uh, basically borax going into into the soot in the air. You don't really want to have it concentrated, say, in a garage or in a building, but outside it's fine. Whereas uh, some of the other colors are really pretty dangerous. Um, I do not at all suggest um, using old road flares, breaking up old road flares and soaking them in alcohol because the, the fumes off that. It is a very lovely pinkish red flame. But the fumes off that will make you sick in very short order, and you don't want your actors or your, your patrons sick. Um, I have not had very good luck with alcohol and um, Epsom salt yet. It's supposed to give you this lovely purple. It's kind of a very, very pale lilac with a white edge, but it's a very, very weak flame. You can try it and see what you can get, um, and that might be another really interesting kind of, of you know, effect. Um, but you know, watch watch your watch your chemistry because you don't want to poison somebody. So, right? Yeah, yeah. But great. Or when he's experimenting, you lose all your hair. Oh, that too. Oh, yeah, yeah. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Danny, what uh, what kind of uh, tips do you got? I'd say never start too early. There's, or there's never too early to start and plan, right? So, I mean, the, the best time to plan is November, so the next year. Um, you always run out of time, so start planning and experimenting as early as you can for the next year. I couldn't agree more. That is an excellent tip, and that really applies all over the place. But uh, it's a lot of work. The plan ahead is going to save you a lot of muscle later on. I don't think we had a week off. 2014. No, never, not once. Not one. Yep. Yeah, wow. we're already we're already building for July 2016, so I I totally agree with that. Perfection. <laughs> so of course, of course, I'm also trying to do something absolutely insane for next year. So you know, on a DIY situation, time really will save you an awful lot of frustration and money. So mm. you know, plan long. <laughs> oh yeah. So back to the chemistry. So do you guys do anything with the other senses? You've got you've got sound and you've got motion and you've got light. What about senses of smell and humidity and other things that set uh, the mood? We've certainly done all of the above. We've added sense to our fog. Uh, we've had real roadkill yes. and allowed that to waft. <laughs> yeah. uh, Yes. Oh, no. I love you guys. <laughs> we, we, we really, really try to attack all five senses, whether it's the feeling of a spider web in your face, the smell of something decaying somewhere, the visuals. Unfortunately, with video, you only get the visual and the audio, but when we, when we go live, um, we really try to attack all five senses. Yeah. I mean, sure. and, and Anthony, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to hear that you were actually through the haunt last year uh, and that you experienced some of that. Uh, and that's great because often we don't talk to many people, you know, um, uh, that have to hear that kind of feedback. But yes, we, we absolutely attempted to, to hit all five senses. And whether it's a disorientation, like we were talking about with the incline and the dizzying and, and the... Uh, the offset strobe lights that can give you that feeling, uh, you know, all of those things. Very important. Absolutely touch on all of the senses if possible. 
You bet. And well, a few of the people don't have. Experience-driven entertainment is our goal. Mm -hmm. as yeah. We move forward. Mm -hmm. Well, it leaves it leaves quite an impression. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I use that Holy Trinity kind of smart aleck comment: the haunts, horror, and Halloween. And you know, my family we live for it year round. Um, there's, <laughs> it's it's what we're into. I mean, for Labor Day, my wife and I celebrated Labor Day of all things with a 15 horror movie film fest, you know? Um, it's just what we're into. Uh, but here we are, we're working towards a year since I saw your show, and my wife and kids still talk about it. And we visit professional commercial haunts, which we're huge fans, fans of, and we tried to, because last year was our first year that we weren't haunters, so it was our chance to finally go out and see home haunts mm -hmm. um, instead of putting one on. And we saw, I believe, Eight home haunts last year, and I think ten pro haunts we went to. Wow. And uh, of all of the shows we saw, yours and one of the pro haunts are the two that we're still talking about a year later. Oh. You know, and I mean that really says something about the production that you guys do and the work you put into it. Thank you so much. That means it's the world to us. It absolutely you. does. Yes. Thank you. Huge. If we could, or when, not if there are no ifs, <laughs> when. We take it to the commercial enterprise that we want to take Dark Rose Manor, then yes, all of the above is our intentions. The stage presence, the experience for people to be involved in something, just the storytelling, the richness of it all. That's yeah. definitely our Lighting. goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely our goal. And in the meantime, this was supposed to be our year off, so we we just gotta just uh, get back to some of our own basics, but uh, there'll still be fog and there'll still be lights. And mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe a maybe a little eye candy for you. But... A lot more playing with lights this year. It's gonna be fun. Yes. Cool. Oh, a note on that fire, guys. Um, don't fill your torches all the way. Fill them about three quarters of the way because it heats up and expands. And do not ever add an oxidizer. I've seen a few people recommending adding hydrogen peroxide. That turns your torch into a jet engine in a bad way, so just a safety thing <laughs> there. Good, Good tips. And if, if you're using live fire in a haunt, the rule of thumb is to keep it the, the height of whatever it's on plus two feet away from anything potentially flammable, and that includes people. So, you know, if, if you've got a row of torches, you want a fence between your patrons and the torches so somebody doesn't reach out and go, well, that's a fake effect, and then, you, you know, they want to sue you or something stupid, so. So that was going to be my next question, is if somebody out there is listening to this and they're hearing about electric pickles and mixing <laughs> chemicals, are there good resources online for safety guidelines for these kind of installations? Are, is there anywhere that people can go look to learn how to keep their neighborhood haunt, you know, safe. If you have fire, you're going to have to be inspected by the uh, local fire marshal, and he's going to be using National Fire Protection Association's NFPA 160 as the guideline. So that's readily available online. You can read it on their site, um, and that's a lot of that won't apply. Um, if you go to show control for your fire effects, then you get into a different class of effect, and there's a lot more restrictions, there's a lot more hoops you have to jump through, there's a lot more things you need to know about. Um, so I, I, I strongly recommend that you don't actually have um, anything that's actually controlled by, say, an Adreno or Arduino. I can't say that word. By a computer or something like that, um, if at all possible, anything that's potentially dangerous should be controlled by an operator who can look and see for sure that there is nobody inside the zone. And um, as far as the rest of that goes, I think they've got something up about accessibility, you know, for things like strobe lights and haunts and things like that, but I can't remember the number on that. There is one other thing that you always have to take into consideration, especially when you're talking about anything in FPA, is there's always an authority having jurisdiction. And that could be your city, um, it could be just a municipality or a county. Here in Aurora, to do our haunt on our property, even organized with permits, insurance, as an LLC, there was no 
flame allowed. No live flame was allowed at all, even though we had fire retardant over everything. So as you do research for any event, commercial, residential, or otherwise, always contact your authority having jurisdiction because their say overrides even the NFPA. And as an electrician, I'm fully aware of AHJ. So I'll always start with them and work your way out from there. Mm -hmm. They will clue you into exactly what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. I fully well, second you, that one. You, you brought up a, a word that's probably going to scare a lot of listeners. Uh, it scared me a little bit, and that's the insurance. Could you talk a little bit about that? Are you guys carry a general liability? Um, you yes. know, Danny, that same question would go to you. Is this something that you've had to deal with as well? Go ahead, Danny. You start. Um, well, I, I personally haven't had to deal with the liability or insurance aspect of it. Um, uh, working with the Alamance Arts Council, they've uh, they've managed the the insurance reliability uh, for that from that respect. Uh, for us, it was absolutely a general liability: um, one million per incident, three million aggregate. Um, for uh, the span of time and the length of time that we were to run, uh, we could go beyond that and ensure it from the beginning of build, for instance, if we had volunteers helping us, et cetera, that would cover that as well, mm -hmm. uh, which was certainly something that the city recommended but was not required. Uh, but, however, that general liability was absolutely required for every night that we were to open to the public, period. Don't just think that your homeowners is going to cover this. It absolutely does not. Do not think that a simple enter at your own risk sign at the front is going to cover it. It does not. And there are differences whether you are or can charge admission versus <laughs> having private parties. There's always loopholes, and you really, again, whether you're talking about your safety or your insurance or which inspections you need, every county, every city, every municipality is so different. different. Mm -hmm. Research, research, research before you do any event, whether it's home or professional, whether it's a concert or your own home haunt. There's no need for anybody to freak out. No, Most of the time, not. if you're running a free home haunt it's and you're sure. inviting people, then it's a private residence where you're doing your thing. Um, General public coming in sometimes that's where it gets a little bit sketchy and I know we're getting a little bit off topic here but the gist of it is is do your research check with your city uh, the municipality locally and uh, make sure your butt is covered because it can bite if, you later. And if you're not <laughs> looking out for your clientele or your fans or the public at large uh, maybe you're not doing the right thing anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and, and more than anything else, it's, you know, in most cases, most home haunters and commercial haunters are absolutely looking out for the best interests of their patrons anyhow. Uh, just make sure that you're covering all your bases with what's expected of you via the city. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. You brought up a good one there, too. Uh, you guys fire retard everything. There's some really good uh, DIY fire retardants that are also a really good idea. And not to mention having fire extinguishers and all that kind of stuff, too. Absolutely, yeah. There are definitely some good recipes for that. Just make sure that if your city requires a certificate of compliance, yes, uh, your the UL DIY isn't going to do it. Your documentation mm -hmm. are a little tougher to prove, even if you can prove the effectiveness without a UL rating mm -hmm. and documentation to back it up. They mm -hmm. might not accept it. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a whole other DIY topic, though, you know, getting licensing for building stuff. Definitely. Right. That's why I said I think we're a little <laughs> off topic. <laughs> well, so bringing it back, bringing it back uh, to the personal level, I, I've got a suggestion, but what's everybody's suggestion for a one simple prop that a DIYer could make for Halloween? And my suggestion is a Larson scanner. Have you ever heard of a Larson scanner? Love them. Yes. So Larson, 
Larson was the creator of Battlestar Galacticon. Remember the Cylons and their eyes go yeah. back and forth? Yeah. So what you can do is you can carve a pumpkin to make a Cylon head, and then you put seven LEDs and you just drive it with a ten uh, segment counter, and what you do, uh, LED, it's seven LEDs, so it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it jumps back with some diode logic to do the intermediate ones to sweep back and forth. So you can make some Cylon pumpkins for your uh, porch using just a 9-volt battery and a 555 timer and some stuff from Radio Shack if you can still find one. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. I should laugh, but I tell you, Radio Shack has come out three times this week, and and it's like a it's like a theme, and it's such a heartbreaker for me. But uh, you know what? They shouldn't ask me for my damn phone number, and they should have quit trying to sell phones to begin with. They kind of got what they deserve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So what's everybody else's suggestion for that one prop that the average DIYer could build that's really cool? Uh, well, it depends on what they want to get into. Um, one of the things that I would probably recommend is, you know, applying that hacker ethos to your entry-level fog machine. So uh, if you go to, uh, especially this month, if you go to, for example, one of the seasonal Halloween stores or something like that to buy a fog machine, one, you're going to have to pull out a second mortgage because, I mean, the prices are ridiculous and they're smart enough to know that September, October, they can get, you know, far more money for it. But uh, a couple of things I'd say about fog machines is if you can get one, maybe find one on eBay, maybe find one in a thrift store, or pay full tilt at, a, at a, a retail store. And then don't just accept the timer that they put on it. You can do fun stuff like, for example, take that timer, um, void your warranty, hack it, and use a motion detector instead of the actual just simple timer so that the fog machine can be placed behind something and then when people approach it then it'll actually release the juice. The other thing is is keep in mind um, that fog machines create fog by heating up uh, glycerin basically and if you want to get more of an eerie effect and you've taken the time to hack your timer and have it actually spit fog when you want it to, go ahead and go the extra mile and build yourself a chiller, a fog chiller, and they're made out of parts you've already got at the house. You can make a temporary one out of, out of you can literally make one out of cardboard. It won't last long, but you could. But, trash you know, cans. cut up a cooler or a trash can or a, one of the large storage bins and make a fog chiller, and then when the person approaches, you've hacked the timer, so it releases the fog when you want it to, and it stays low to the ground and gives you that kind of eerie effect that people are looking for this time of year. Anthony stole my project. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Sorry. Uh, for, for the do-it-yourselfers, uh, one of the oldest school props that uh, a lot of us haunters have used along the way that we've since learned through some of our our friends' actual uses of it is the flying crank ghost. Mm -hmm. uh, the flying crank ghost is an exceedingly simple thing using a simple slow motor, a little bit of cable, so you're raising one side while you're lowering the other. But, uh, um, a million uses for that. A million uses. I don't want to go into a lot of name dropping and everything, but the, I've seen him used for a lot of things. Marionettes, ghosts, uh, zombies. Grave diggers. So for the, uh, yeah. the average yeah. or just starting do-it-yourselfer that wants to get into some motor-driven stuff, go with the Flying Crank Ghost. The FCG is one of the coolest, most versatile, easy starter props you can go with. And once you've got the basics of working with that motor, there's a million ways you could go. And with the that. more pulleys yeah. and things you put on it, the more motions you can get out of it. And it all starts with that one simple circular motion. And speed controllers can obviously just ramp that up a million times too. Mm -hmm. yep. Dang it, there goes my backup project. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going Sorry, to the John. restroom then. <laughs> that's, no, that's absolutely uh, one of the best suggestions there is. The Crank Ghost is one of those things that, that you can do so much with. Um, 
you know, after somebody watches this, I would suggest that they they just go pull it up on YouTube and see because they can do so many cool things. Yes, absolutely, agreed. What about you, Danny? Um, I don't know. There's a couple of different directions. Um, I I heard uh, somebody mention chicken wire before. Um, there's definitely things you can do that are stationary. If you're starting out, like doing the chicken wire ghost from afar kind of thing. Um, uh, I guess the one that I'd mention is. Um, if you're just starting out, uh, look look into converting your garage into a into a television. You, if you can get a hold of a projector or rent a projector, you can make turn it into a reverse mirrored image, um, and you can iron wax paper together to make the largest screen as you want, um, and then just sit there and have a private graded you know horror movie showing with 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 your family. You know, kind of thing. If that, if you've never done anything before, that's a real good one to get you in in the spirit. Did Agreed. you just say wax paper together, Danny? Yeah, that's that's actually how I'd gotten started years back. Um, I bought four rolls of wax paper, um, laid it out. I uh, actually found a when I was researching online, found it on a Boy Scout website where they had uh, weaved it together and then just make sure it's close together. Then then using iron to, on, on a low heat, you can iron it together. It has a pretty good capacity. Wow. Excellent for rear projection as well. How was the clarity on that? It was actually pretty good. It was pretty good for you know, three dollar screen. Yeah, great tip. Thank you. And it has a very wavy, you know, spooky look to it. I like spooky. Sorry, one, go ahead, Tim. No, there was there was one thing that I did for um, a Halloween, and it was a spur of the moment thing, and it was dirt cheap. Uh, I went out to the garage and I found some one by one. Uh, furring strips, and I built a frame, and then I took some of that uh, that thin plastic that you put on the windows that you heat shrink with a uh, a hair dryer for insulation, mm -hmm. and I made a large frame that was taller and wider than my do front door with that on it, and I was able to pull off a Pepper's Ghost effect nice. with eight dollars worth of parts. Um, and it was funny because my daughter was going, "Well, I want to do something. I want to do something." And I came up, oh, well, you know what, let's try this. And we completely freaked out everybody in the neighborhood that came up to the door because she would have the light switch on me, and she'd say, oh, you see that chair? There's a ghost that's right there. And she'd flip the switch on, which would be aimed at me, and I'm sitting in a different chair, and poof, I'm there. And the number of people that would just freak out and run, and it's not, you know, almost nothing in, in time. Um, you don't have to have a big, expensive mirror because that thin plastic will do the job for you. And one other thing that I've seen uh, people around here do for just a small effect for walking up, every single person in the world in the dark is incredibly afraid of unstable footing. So a piece of wood with a, a another piece of wood underneath it so it teeters, someone steps on it, they're going to freak. You know, even if it just moves a quarter of an inch. Yep. Yeah, I, I I could speak to both of those things. The irony about the Pepper's Ghost is it's one of my favorite illusions of all time. We've never actually done one, and then yes, the unsure footing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen things at Trans World where they had billiard balls, or I've heard of golf balls being used, so the floor is moving. Mm -hmm. Haven't done that either, but yes, I believe in unsure footing. Mm -hmm. And, even if you're uh, yeah. just trying to go for a subterranean kind of feeling, even if all you do is have them step down one step, they feel like they they're feel descending. like they're descending. Uh, oh, if you sure. have them go, yeah, just one step. That's Black all it takes. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, that was our 2013 home for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> uphill, and yet they feel like they're descending into the ice cap. Right. Take them up a few Give steps them and then make them step, step down. down. And then they're in. Mm -hmm. It's all illusion. It's all about yeah. making them believe they're Perception. part of another world. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I, I guess my lazy one is is audio. Take some audio and slow it down with uh, anything. Reaper or um, oh, what's the free one everybody else uses? Audacity. Thank you. Audacity. 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 Yes. <laughs> Can live without audacity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Slow down the audio so it's low and creepy. Because that's just kind of unnerving. Absolutely. But with sound, 
please always remember my wife is an expert on this. It, it, layer it, layer it, layer it, layer it to death. If and then it, one single track, one one single track is never going to do it. You've got to layer it. Even if you only put two layers of audio together, that's something. You get ten layers of tracks, and now you're creating something that, even if you're using a pop song, you can't recognize it anymore. You're creating. And it's fairly simple uh, as well to split your tracks from uh, left to right. So if you've got a stereo track, you can you can and you've layered several tracks into one another, you can actually take them down to a mono track and split so that it, one track plays on the left channel. One t track plays on the right channel so that now you've got that disorientation from cool. the uh, sounds playing from one side to the other. And then add reverb. <laughs> Absolutely. There's my geek. Yes. And, then, and then add cowbell. Yes, cowbell. <laughs> so to add my own cowbell to this, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, for Maker News, obviously today everybody's social media feeds have been exploding with news about a student in Texas who was arrested for bringing a circuit board, a, a clock that he had made to school, and uh, his name is Ahmed Mohammed. And I was wondering what folks thought about this, and you know, especially since you're talking about having spooky insulation, you're talking about legal issues. You know, how do people misunderstand technology or maker projects? And what are the implications when the police show up and ask, what is this? We're taking you away. What's that electric pickle? <laughs> well, I wanna, I'm going to just jump in really briefly. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be too inflammatory because, frankly, mm. it's not my network and it's not my show. But I certainly have strong opinions, and those who know me know I'm usually not shy about offering them. But uh, what took place today... I've got today, the beat button ready. <laughs> what took place in Irving, <laughs> Texas today was was literally an embarrassment. Um, I was embarrassed for the school. I was embarrassed for the authorities. I was embarrassed for their community because they really uh, they stepped on their own you-know-whats today when they put a 14-year-old boy in handcuffs and uh, led him away for him bringing in something that he was proud of. He brought into school... Um, a project that he had built on his own at 14 years old that was far beyond his age. You know, he really he showed that he's something special, and uh, the school overreacted, the community overreacted, the authorities overreacted, and I was embarrassed for them. Um, I don't want to get too into it because, like, I would typically use the F word at this point, and uh, I'm from Colorado, so we're usually quick to criticize Texas anyways. That's what we do. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip that. I do want to, before I let someone else jump in on this, I do want to just point out that our president actually got involved today um, via Twitter, and I just want to read this. I've queued it up, but he actually, con he, he said via Twitter today, cool clock, Ahmed. Want to bring it to the White House? We should inspire more kids like you to like science, it's what makes America great, and I just want to, I just want to point that out that there are people who appreciate what that kid's done. So I absolutely agree, and the unfortunate part of the story is, of course, that we, well, again, have that unfortunate heritage of racism, and there is certainly that element to his story. It's not about being intelligent. If he have been Asian or Caucasian, these things go down differently. And unfortunately, intelligence can't be judged by itself. It has to be colored, so to speak, or tainted by others' perception of color. And that's the most unfortunate thing. Yeah, absolutely agree. despicable, in our opinion, personally. Agreed. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the biggest thing that hit me was did anybody even just walk up to him and ask him, what is this? Show me th show me this. The whole thing could have been just a footnote in someone's, oh, well, this child brought in this really neat device. Instead, it panic and everything else got thrown forward, and nobody took the time just to sp spend 10 seconds and say, what is this? Well, yeah. that's what's great about uh, your show, if I can plug something do it yourself, and shows meant 
to display curiosity and passion, those things should ramp up more than paranoia and irrational beliefs. So maybe we can all get back to the intelligence that this one child is showing and maybe he can be inspiring and that we can get back to curiosity and adventure and exploration rather than paranoia and backwards thinking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My concern is this is really setting a bad precedent for the maker movement. You know, now we're all afraid of makers. I, that's not a good thing. The makers are the people who will build the future of the world. Well, I think there's a certain amount of technophobia and technical ignorance, too. If you, he built this out of parts of another clock. I mean, it's, it's a manufactured circuit board. You know, I think I would think that anybody that was a teacher or an administrator should be able to look at that and say, well, he's 14 years old, he's on the robotics club, so he's clearly doing these kind of projects. He has access to this kind of knowledge and technology. He's in an engineering class at the school. So I can understand the English teacher not understanding what it was, maybe calling in the principal, you know, we want to be safe, we want to make sure, you never know, things like Columbine, you just want to make sure that there's not a problem, but... To then go the extra step to have five policemen escort him out in handcuffs when there's no intent there, there's no history there, that's just too much. I think that it's safe to say that was show and tell gone very wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was show and tell part of the police department, yeah. in fact. Yeah. And, yeah. That yeah. It was an unnecessary overreach and overcompensation for basically the the heart of the society in its current state. And, and that's and sad I agree because it's with riddled with ignorance, truly. The makers, um, you know, our, our maker mentality has obviously been spent a little more on Halloween, so to speak, and it doesn't matter that we're also helping make communities and helping make networks and relationships. The fact that it's centered on Halloween, that's always going to be the gist of what they're seeing and that invites criticisms that are political or religious in nature when that's absolutely or, not the or, case. Or so, racial like this seemed to be. Yeah, the, the, the focus is absolutely missing the mark of what was at the heart of the matter originally. We could go on for that. About yeah, that for days. About so that. somebody Absolutely. else take over. <laughs> well, we've completely consumed an hour and ten minutes. Uh, we went ten over, which is fine because we started late. I want to thank all of you very much for being here. This is a, an awesome. This is exactly what I was hoping this whole episode was going to turn out to be. Um, all kinds of tangents, but all kinds of ideas and tons of good yeah. information. Um, I want to thank every single one of you for here uh, showing here and being part of this podcast. I want to remind everybody that uh, this is the DIY show on the AV Nation Network where we have plenty of other wonderful podcasts to listen to. Um, this has been, again, a blast. Thank you, uh, Anthony, Ben, everyone. This is Happy been to be here. Before we close out, I just wanted to find out, Danny, uh, Pandora, August, do you guys have any place you'd like to send people online where they can find out more about you? Go ahead, Danny. Danny, take it. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'm heavily involved with the Alamance Makers Guild. I'd, I'd say alamancemakers.org um, <laughs> is where we put a lot of our stuff uh, out there. Excellent. Uh, we can be found at darkprosemanner.com. Uh, if you aren't feeling like doing the typing, you can Google Dark Rose Manor, Dark Rose, all one word, and we'll pop up all, pretty much all over the place, Facebook, YouTube, Blogger. Uh, we have a blog yeah. spot. We have a website of our own. We have a Facebook page. YouTube. We have a company on LinkedIn, and we are following AV Nation on LinkedIn as well. Mm -hmm. So we are on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. Blogspot, <laughs> Flickr, <laughs> New York City, Etsy, you name it, we're out there. <laughs> we're building an Etsy shop, so Dark Rose, all one manner. Yep. Dark Rose, manner. Awesome. Yep. And Bennett, our new co-host, I'm so excited you're here. Is there any place you'd like folks to find out more about you online as well? Well, I've got Harris Educational, uh, 
you can look that up on Facebook, all one word, Harris Educational. I'm also with the Alamance Makers Guild. We're doing a lot here in the community. We produce the Burlington Mini Maker Fair, so you can look up any of those terms and find stuff that we're doing. Cool. Awesome. It was, Excellent. It was truly, truly a pleasure to meet with all of you tonight to be a part of this. We are absolutely honored and grateful thank you. for the invitation. Yes. We had a wonderful time. Pleased to make some new friends. Thank you. And uh, we hope to have you back again in a future episode. I want to thank everyone. And just on the same, on this ending note, thanks for watching the DIY show. We'll be back uh, next month with actually a very special episode. I don't want to give away too much uh, information about it yet because we don't we're not completely solidified on it. So, good night. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. This is AV Nation.